Welcome out to church this morning. It's great to be in church on a Sunday morning. Let's all stand in this place this morning. We're going to sing my Savior.
it says in the second section of that scripture it says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or woman and so I just want to encourage people this morning let's pray like it's the last time that you can pray and we need God to move in our lives because it's desperate and there's a couple of desperate needs uh, our pastor and Adelina there in India and he's preaching a revival and, uh, and we want to see God move we want to see the Chennai church inspired and helped they've been um, thrashed around by the devil for the last few years their pastor's been crook all that sort of stuff and so we want to just pray for pastor uh, for words of knowledge praying that God would use him in praying for the sick that there'd be conversions in that church we want to lift up our pastor uh, Reddy and Joe in, in our baby Hornsby church uh, pastor Jade and me his wife in Manukau they need a building uh, they, they're, the people that own the building have said it's time to let's move on um, find another building, so they need a building. And our Pastor Scott and Annie in Gdynia, uh, just to pray that God would build a strong church there in um, in Poland, and that God would um, just just bring people in. You know, there's that whole unrest in Russia that's just right next door. You know, with Russia and and uh, the, and Ukraine. And so let's just see that God would move in that, and God would speak to us this morning a word in season for our lives. 
and uh, and that's obviously we're going to pray for Pastor Corey for that because he's preaching. So let's uh, pray, and I'll get Marcus if you want to close us off in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we do worship you, we praise you, God, God, we pray, God, you move this morning in our lives, God, God, for word and season, God, for direction, God, God, we need a miracle in our lives this morning, Heavenly Father, you can make a lot of Turn and greet one another. Amen. Praise God. Just by way of announcement this morning, we've got a concert tonight. The band's playing tonight, so feel free to invite somebody. And uh, that would be at 6.30. And so if you've got a flyer there, uh, 6.30 is the time uh, that would be on the flyer. And so, um, and the phone number, you can ring Mick if you've got any questions. Because pastor's in India and it's got his name on the flyer. Um, and Anzac Day tomorrow. Um, some of the guys are going to go down to Gregson Park down here to do to do the Anzac thing. So, if anybody wants to come along, speak to me or Ben, and uh, and we'll just meet you down there. And Dan Villani Revival is coming in the middle of May, towards the end of May next month. And so, if you can begin to pray for that, those that fast, start fasting for that. Those that don't fast, start fasting for that. Yeah, come on. Those that pray, pray. Those that don't pray, pray. And I just see that, you know, God, it could be a turning point in the church. You know, we've been seeing some visitors come in, mm-hmm. been seeing God do some good things in the church. And I just pray that God would have a word in season for you for that. Let's give God praise as the ushers come forward. Father, we thank you, God, for the blessings of the Lord. Be like honeycomb. It's a word of inspiration. Someone has said, there are three kinds of givers, the flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. So which one would you identify with? To get anything out of a flint, you must hammer it. And then you only get chips and sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you must squeeze it. And the more, uh, sorry, and the more you, the more you use pressure, the more you'll get. But the honeycomb just overflows with its sweetness. Mm. Which kind of giver are you? And so I don't say that to make anyone feel bad because I know that everyone in this church is probably more like honeycomb than anything else, you know. Second Corinthians says this, but I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. And so I know we're a small church, but look at that. We also punch above our weight as a church, and that's because most of the, I would have to say, all the people in this church, you, we're honeycomb givers, you know. If pastor says, oh, we've got a need, we want to do this. The money just comes in, and, and I just uh, appreciate being in a church with people that have that attitude towards giving. And uh, with that, Ben, if you want to pray over the offering, thanks. Lord God, thank you for the liberal heart you've given us, Lord God, and thank you that we see the work that you do with our tithes and offerings. And ask your blessing upon every gift and give it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So this morning we've got Pastor Corey, uh, Evangelist Corey Bourne, uh, preaching for us. And so 
everybody here uh, would know of him. People that don't, he's been around for about 30 years in the fellowship, got saved, uh, become a disciple in the church. He's pioneered churches. He's been an evangelist. He's taken over uh, running churches and uh, God uses him. I remember one story I've got about four years ago, Jen and I were going through a bit of a rough patch and, uh, and out of the blue, I get a phone call from Corey and he said, hey, how are you going? You know, I don't know what's going on, but I just felt like God wanted me to give you a call. And I said, oh, blah, blah, blah. This has happened. That's happened. This has happened. Blah, blah, blah. And he said, right. You're not the only one. Everyone's Everyone has uh, gone through this that's around your age. What you need to do is blah, 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 blah. And, and so I did those things. And two years later, Josh got saved again. And that all, you know, not that Pastor Staples wasn't telling me the same things, but it was just a word. Corey obviously heard from God. It was a word in season right at that moment. And, uh, and that's the kind of man that's coming to preach for us this morning. So whatever he says this morning... Try and apply it to your life and uh, make sure it lines up with the Word of God. But praise God. (laughs) (laughs) Pastor Dawn, thank you very much. Good morning, are we on? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. That's a good official one. Well, let me put my timer on. I was a marvel to preach all day. I like to preach the gospel. Amen. If you've got your Bible this morning, Always good to be in Newcastle. Mm-hmm. Love the Newcastle church, love Newcastle. I say everywhere I go around the world, they say, where are you from? I said, at the heart of greatness, you'll find someone from Newcastle. <laughs> they, they get upset with me, but I'm still, I'm still, I'm still propagating that doctrine. <laughs> Amen. First uh, Kings, First Kings 18, beginning in verse 17. Pastor uh, gave me a call, asked me to come and preach for you guys the other week. And I wasn't quite sure what to preach. Anzac Day is coming up, so I've got a little bit of an Anzac uh, illustration there at the start. But really sort of felt God wanted me to minister along these lines. And uh, God actually gave me some scriptures this morning. or well, last night woke me up uh, in the book of Ezekiel. And I'm not going to, this isn't part of the sermon. I just sort of felt stirred that this was something for this church. In the book of Ezekiel 38, uh, Pastor Farrell just preached a great sermon about the Battle of Gog and Magog in Russia, what's happening in Russia. Um, That was sort of three, four days before the Russians invaded Ukraine. And uh, I felt God really stir me to the first two verses. It says, Now the word of the Lord came, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Gog, the prince of Rosh and Meshesh and Tubal and the prophet against him. And say, thus says the Lord. And then it sort of led me to verse 11. And in verse 11, it talks about uh, God being Russia, picking on somebody like Israel who's in peace. And God just said this to me, that in these days that we're in right now, the devil is picking a fight with the church. He's picking a fight with, with God's people on every level. He's trying to destroy our faith. He's trying to... Uh, come against us and create fear and havoc and get people to drop away. This is the, Jesus is coming back, folks. Yes. We're living in the last days. And so I really sort of felt God saying to me that, you know, I saw in your prayer room that this is the, this is the year of uh, war, 100%. Absolutely. We're in that time when uh, Jesus is coming back. We need to have, be on the front foot and taking dominion. And so before I turn to the text... Uh, Anzac Day is tomorrow. I love Anzac Day. Going to the Anzac Day service. Used to go to the Shortland uh, RSL when I was a little kid. And uh, Cubs, dib, 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 dob, 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 and all that sort of stuff. And watch the uh, service at like, you know, 4.30 in the morning. And I'd go there and it was freezing cold. We'd never wear jackets. And we were talking to Gavin Spruce the other a couple of months ago about that. It was just like, the, must have been the coldest place to have the Anzac Day service ever. <laughs> but it was a great time. And so... Um, I was always drawn to, uh, you know, great endeavours in the in war. I uh, joined. That's one of the reasons why I joined the Defence Force. I was in the in the in the Navy for six years. But one one person asked me some time ago, uh, "Are you a warmonger? Is that why you is that why you joined the Defence Force?" And I said, "What? Like no." And I said to him, "Without people that are willing to fight for righteousness and truth and what is right." then evil prevails. 
The reason why there's wars is because there's evil people. And it takes the righteous people to rise up and say, I'm going to meet you with the same amount of force that you're going to come and try and take away what is good. That's what war is about. It's establishing peace. It's establishing dominion. There's a man called Albert Jacker. I don't know if you know him. He's the first man in the First World War, first Australian man to ever um, receive the Victoria Cross in the First World War, first man. Not the first Victoria Cross, but the first one in the First World War. He uh, was a young guy from uh, Victoria. Uh, he joined the Defence Force with his two brothers, three of them went to Gallipoli and Albert Jacker was uh, in the trenches before they actually stormed the machine guns at the neck. So it would have been the very, very early parts of Gallipoli storming the beaches. This guy went through every major battle in the First World War and survived. And I believe it's because his, his mum was a Christian and had been praying for uh, him and his brothers the whole time. All three of them survived miraculously from one family, three brothers going to the First World War to survive. It's a miracle. But there was a particular day and Albert was a private and he was up in the, the forward trenches and what had happened was there's a no, no man's land area and uh, 15 Turkish soldiers had crawled across and they jumped into the trench and caught about five Australians out of position and they started shooting at them in the trenches. There was a communication trench that went around the back. Albert Jacker ran down, told the captain that was at the, at the position, this is what's happened. Uh, they ran up together. As they ran up together, they had like hand grenades and, and handguns and, uh, and he had a rifle. And as they're coming uh, up the trench, the captain's going to save the day. Uh, the captain sort of steps forward, gets shot in the head, dead, bang, and Albert's sort of standing there thinking, what am I going to do? My mates are up there. Uh, there's a lot of Turkish soldiers in there. So what this guy does is amazing courage. He thinks to himself, well, hang on, no man's land's out there. The Turkish are not going to shoot their own soldiers if they jump out of the trench. So he jumps out of the trench and runs towards the Turkish line, runs down the side of the trench, and sees these guys in the trench fighting his guys, comes up from behind them, starts throwing hand grenades and dives into the trench like Superman with a handgun and a, and a, uh, a rifle. Boom, boom, boom. Shoots five bayonets, another one, and captures five Turkish soldiers and wins the Victoria Cross. And they asked him, what were you thinking, Albert? And he said, I just wanted to save my mates. I just wanted to save my mates. That's what he said. And it's interesting because I want you to think about courage because it takes courage to fight the fight of faith. Yes. It takes courage to pray. It takes courage to believe that God wants to help us. A couple of weeks later, Albert became famous. He was the pin-up poster guy of the Australian Army and the Australian Defence Force. Uh, they used him to try and get more people to go into the Defence Force. But two weeks later, he found himself in the forward trench again, ready to run against the machine guns when they stormed the neck. 6,000 soldiers died in less than half a day on that particular spot, 6,000 Australian soldiers. It's about the size of two tennis courts wide and about three tennis courts long, so probably about the size of this building, maybe a little bit bigger, twice. And he was in the second wave that was going to storm the machine guns, and he, he's there and he's listening to the orders and the lieutenant was standing on the end. He was on one end. And uh, the guys, you've seen the movie, Gallipoli, a lot of people have seen that movie. The guys jump up over the trench and the, the whole uh, line of them just gets mowed down by the machine guns. He's listening to this and he turns to, the, turns to the lieutenant and he says these words. He says, this is not courage. This is not courage. This is insanity. What are we doing? We're wasting our lives. We're wasting good men's lives. This is not right. And as he's, as he's starting to argue with the lieutenant, more guys on his end of the line, they're all like, hang on a minute, Albert's not very keen to jump over the top. This is probably not a good idea. <laughs> and so they're all sort of coming down, they're listening like this. He's arguing with the lieutenant and trying to reason with him. The lieutenant pulls his pistol out, puts it on Jacker's head and says to him, Albert, this is treason. Uh, you're going to do what you're ordered to do. And so he says, okay, he turns to these guys and said, listen, this is not courage. This is stupidity. 
what we're going to do is, if you want to survive, follow me. And he jumps up over the trench and he runs straight at the machine gun with his head as low as he possibly can and makes it across. 30 guys follow him and they actually get down behind a wall just short of the machine gun and they survive. 30 soldiers that, that were the only 30 soldiers that survived that day from that charge. And I thought about that and I thought, you know what? Sometimes as Christians, we can do and say dumb things. Yeah. We can take unnecessary risks because listen to me, our main adversary is our self. Amen. Your flesh, you, your stupidity and your willingness to be stupid and do dumb things. Yeah. That's the, that was a dumb order that somebody's given. But Albert, he's going, okay, right up. I need to follow the, I need to follow the process here. But his courage won the day. And I want to think with you about the whole idea of courage. I want to have a look at Elijah. Let's read our text. 1 Kings 18, beginning in verse 17. It says, my Bible has a heading. The title of my sermon is Blood and Fire is Needed. If we're going to fight this fight, supernatural battle, we need blood and fire. Amen? It says, and it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab the king said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? Imagine coming to church and pastor says, Is that you, the troubler of the church? <laughs> and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, this is Elijah, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals, false gods. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. My Bible has a heading. It says, Elijah's Mount Carmel victory. Listen, we need to have victory as born-again believers when it comes to the supernatural realm. We need victory. We need dominion. This is what the devil is fighting us for right now in our nation. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you... Falter between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. There's many people today, you ask them about God and Christianity and they just got nothing to say. It's like they look at you dumbfounded. They can't understand that the world is truly a spiritual place. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. And let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the, uh, on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers with fire or by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well. It's like they found their voice. They want to see, see people want to see supernatural things. It's just that they don't want it to be God. They want it to be some dumb, stupid, witchcraft, satanic evil, some sort of spiritual feeling, but they don't want God to tell them what to do. This is, this is reality. Yeah. This, is the, this is the generation we live in. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no answer, no one, uh, no voice, no one answered. And then they leapt about the altar which they had made. Get the picture. They're, they're yelling out to a false god. Nothing's happening. So they start to leap about like demon-possessed frogs. 450 of them. See, this is the stupidity of false religion. This is the stupidity of Christianity without Jesus. Yeah. This is the stupidity of Christianity without the power of the blood, without the power of the Holy Ghost, the fire of God. You can't live a spiritual life unless you're connected to the blood of Jesus Christ yeah. and filled with his power. False religion is rampant in our nation. Our nation is gripped by fear. It's gripped by antichrist. It's gripped by Jezebel, immorality. It's gripped by all sorts of evils. And it needs us 
to take the fight to the battle, to the gate. Verse 27, it says, And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. Has anyone ever been mocked for your Christianity? Yeah? You ever been mocked? Tell people about Jesus you mocked. I, I really, really liked uh, the COVID uh, last two years. People, you know, I'm, I'm sharing Jesus. They, they mocked me. I'm like, what? What do you believe in? What do you believe in? Because you're sporting gods. They're nowhere to be seen. Your money's not helping you anymore. Tell me what you believe in that's helping you in this time of pandemic and confusion and fear. Is there anything? And they look at me, oh, 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 you know, they're all put out. Because you challenge the fact that they believe in stupidity. Listen, God wants us to challenge people's faith. And ask them, what do you believe? Who do you believe in? Do you believe in yourself? Well, yourself hasn't been able to change anything in the last two years. Really? Yes. Yourself's been locked up. Who would have thought that the whole world would lock up one of the most rebellious nations in the in the world for more than six months? Huh? I thought about that. I thought that's a spiritual thing. Mm. To lock Australia inside for two months at a time, four months at a time, in some places six months. That's miraculous. The devil's pulled it off. But I believe God allowed that to happen as well. To get us to focus on the realities of life. So they cried louder and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until blood gushed out of them. Now they're jumping around like demon-possessed frogs, cutting themselves, blood gushing out. It amazes me how people continue to hold on to false religion and false hope. It just amazes me. I challenged some peace people recently. I said, you know, what's the power of your religion? And they said, what do you mean? You know, we've sort of got a bit of a debate. And they just said, it's all we know. It's all we know. We were born in this. It's what we know. Listen, God help us that our church kids wouldn't say those things. That we as, we as born again believers wouldn't say, that's all we know. All we know is the potter's house. Potter's house is good, amen. But listen to me, if it's just the potter's house, we're pitiful. Yes. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. We need God's dominion. We need to know what God wants us to do and be in these last days. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice but there was no voice no one answered no one paid attention then Elijah said to all the people come near to me it takes courage to stand up against the flow and against the tide and against all the people who do not believe that there is a God so all the people came near to him and he prepared the order of the Lord that was broken down and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. And then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seers of seed. Some commentators say this is probably about four foot deep and about four foot wide. It's a big trench. It's a massive trench. It's almost deep and big enough to bury somebody. It says, and he put the wood in order cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill uh, four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. Get the picture. The trench is full of water. The sacrifice is sopping wet. The wood is sopping wet. The blood of the bull Uh, The pieces of the bull, it's all all wet, it's all full of water. So the water ran around the altar and it also filled the trench with water and it came to pass, in verse 36, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, listen to me, it takes simple faith to believe God for supernatural things. Simple faith. Faith that says, you know what, God did it in his word, he can do it again. God has challenged me to believe that he can do supernatural things. 
said uh, the Lord. So he says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. I just wonder how many times we pray. Do we ask God if he's hearing us? Do you believe that God hears you? I asked someone that question, they looked at me and went, oh, I sort of hope so. I don't know if I'm that keen to live for Jesus like that. I sort of hope so. Because that's what gets us to that place where we don't really know who we are and what we believe. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Get the picture. He's, he's, he's there. He's saying, God, prove to us that we are doing the wrong thing, worshipping these false gods. Show us that you're the true God. Then all of a sudden, boom, fire comes down, consumes all the water, consumes the sacrifice and consumes the whole thing. And the people are spinning out. They fall on their faces and go, wow, man, this is, this is the real deal. I don't know about you, but we need our church services to have the power of God like that. Yes. When I was in Melbourne just recently, I, I said this. I said, you know what? We need God to touch our service that when we worship him in the worship service, it doesn't matter how many people are here, we need heaven to come. Amen. We need God's dominion to be in the altar place. We need God to help us that when we take the altar call, people's hearts are convicted. They, fear the, they feel the fear of God like a solid uh, presence of the Holy Ghost touching their life and bringing them into the presence of God. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but that's how I got saved. I had no reason to give my life to Jesus Christ, except that I was insane. And I didn't believe that God was real. Last verse, and Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Oh man, that's beautiful. That's what you do with false religion, you kill it dead. Amen? Amen. Took courage, I'm thinking... You know, this guy's he's standing against, the Bible says, the whole nation. I'm thinking, is the Bible exaggerating? If it was the whole nation, there's a lot of people there. 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah, 850 of them against one guy. Took some <sighs> chutzpah, <laughs> courage, right? Something inside him said, you know what, this is not right. And I believe that God has allowed us to go through this pandemic to, to touch something deep in us. So this is not right. God's kingdom has to have dominion. We need to have the end times revival that God wants us to have. Who knows the Salvation Army? What a tragedy the Salvation Army is to Australia and to the world. What a tragedy. It was a very powerful movement. You know, their symbol is blood and fire. Their logo, their slogan, we live by blood and fire. I've started asking Salvation Army people, what does this mean? They can't answer. They don't know. And I thought to myself, I don't, I don't want my church to be like that. I don't want us to be generational and then lose what God's doing in our lives. Okay. I believe I'm going to see Jesus come back. But listen to me. The gospel must not be watered down. Yes, yes. The power of the Holy Ghost to save souls. The revelation that God gave William Booth is that he had a dream one night. And in the dream, he saw a lake of fire and he came to the edge of the lake of fire. And there was people from his neighborhood and people that he knew, friends and family, that were drowning in the fiery lake. And they were crying out and he was trying to help them and save them. But every time he got close, it was too hot and he couldn't save them. And he woke up in terror. And the, and the Salvation Army was birthed. Listen to me. Don't say sorry to people when we tell them that they're going to hell. They need to know that they're going to hell. 
They need to know that hell is real. They need to know that the fires of hell are going to consume their souls. This is part of the battle, is that in every warfare, the enemy wants to play down what's actually happening. The devil is trying to beguile people's minds so that they get distracted by all sorts of stupidity and not understand that the whole world is going into a spiritual coldness, a spiritual death where they're believing in all sorts of nonsense. That's what's happening. I want to have a look at that whole idea of spiritual coldness. In verse 17 it says, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? I want to ask you, does anyone ever hassle you because your Christianity hassles them? Because if your Christianity is not hassling them, you've got a problem. Hmm? The Bible says, woe when all people speak well of you. And I'm not saying that you want to pick fights with people. I'm not saying you want to be, you know, just a real jerk to people. I'm not saying that. But when you find yourself in a situation and a conversation about the Mardi Gras, about same-sex marriage, about whatever it is that's challenging the righteousness of the Bible, the truth of God's word, then it's our responsibility to stand up and say something. It's our responsibility to say, that's not right. That's insanity. That's same-sex marriage? Are you kidding me? What insanity is that? Forget the science. It doesn't make sense. It's a one-way valve. It's that simple. It's, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. It's, it's fairly simple. Like... Just recently, they're asking, um, you know, politicians, what is a woman? I said, they can't answer a simple question, what is a woman? The world's gone wacky. Yes. It's losing its moorings. They can't tell us. What, how many dictionaries are they? Forget the Bible. They're ripping dictionaries apart and burning them and throwing them away. They're useless. Society's based upon truth and communication. And without the words to communicate, what are you communicating? Stupidity and nonsense. This is fantasy and the demonic. This is what this is. (coughs) Absolutely 100%. Our our nation is gripped by fear. It's gripped by turmoil. It's gripped by all sorts of stupidity. In verse 21, it says, And Elijah came to the people and said, How long will you fall between two opinions? This... Word opinion, it's, a, it's an interesting word, isn't it? Because people ask, they say, oh, what are you, what's your opinion? What do, you, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Has anyone ever been asked, what do you think about the pandemic? What do you, well, as a Christian, what do you think about the virus? What do you think about the vaccine? What do you think? What's your opinion? This word opinion, it means a view or judgment formed about something, not necessarily based upon fact or truth or knowledge. It's interesting Because people have their opinion, don't they? You know the problem with opinions? They're like noses. Everyone's got one. And if you look around, some heads are too small for the nose. And some noses are too big for the head. They don't fit. Hmm? And that's the problem with opinions. The opinions don't always fit. Sometimes they're based upon absolute nonsense and stupidity. Sometimes they're they're based upon rebellion and destruction. We shouldn't give in to opinion. Definitely not public opinion. See, the people of our city and our nation, they need a gospel message through our testimony and through our witness that shares the love and the power of God. We uh, did the suicide thing in Parramatta over the last couple of days and it was interesting on the street because we're street preaching that this is a problem for the whole nation. Suicide is a problem for the whole nation. Every two, uh, between nine people in Australia are committing suicide every two hours, round about. That's a lot. That's a lot of people committing suicide every two hours. They said that was over the last two and a half years. So here it is. There's a problem, but society is not acknowledging the problem. It's just like sin. They don't want to acknowledge sin. They don't want to acknowledge heaven. 
They don't want to acknowledge hell, but it's our responsibility to help them hear an articulated message that's very, very clear that heaven's real and God is real and that he loves them, that he wants to set them free, but their stupidity will be judged. In verse 18 it says, And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed Baals. What is this word Baal? What does it mean? It depends on where in the Bible you look up the meaning of Baal, because Baal has many meanings. And that's, in my mind, as I'm studying this, this is a great picture of the devil and his kingdom. Because you can never really nail exactly what it is. That's what rebellion is, right? That's what witchcraft is. That's what, when people speak words, soothsaying words, in relationships to manipulate. It's like trying to nail jelly to actually get to the truth. That's, a, that's how Baal represents himself. Baal is the world. It's the flesh. It's everything demonic. But this particular Baal, it says Baal was a fertility god in this region. And they worshipped him, and worshipping him involved sexual acts and sexual orgies. With an expectation of some twisted type of fruitfulness or blessing. I don't know about you, but that, that sounds weird right there. Yeah? But listen, let me ask you this. Our nation is gripped by all sorts of insanity. Definitely pornography and perversion. The world is gripped by pornography and perversion. The world is gripped by fantasy games. Demonic fantasy games. Zombie fantasy games. All sorts of... I looked it up and I'm thinking, man, some of this stuff, like, what is this? Witchcraft fantasy games that people play all the time. See, they worshipped an idol which was in the shape... Get the picture, right? So so here's Jezebel and the prophets, these particular prophets. The altar of the Lord is in the temple. And then off to the right-hand side, they've erected a couple of uh, statue idols. And some commentators and historians say one of those was probably a king that existed some time ago. And the other one was a huge 12-foot male anatomy piece, a penis. This is, this is what they're worshipping. You think about this. This is insanity. The whole nation's worship. This is God's people worshipping sexual perversion on another level. I thought about this. This is where our nation is. Our nation's worshipping sexual perversion, immorality, and twisted stupidity yes. when it comes to morals on another level. Yes. It's, it doesn't even make sense. When they can't tell you what a woman is, something's wrong. See, the temple prostitutes supported the temple by their worship of males, by their tithes of evil gain in prostitution. Baal worship was full of perversion, homosexuality, lesbianism, immorality and sexual promiscuity, consumed with lustful thoughts and lustful stupidities, overriding the culture of the day. The culture of the day was a perverted lust for more. Not just sexual things, all things. It's interesting because I thought, how in the world did God's people who had the truth end up there? How? That's, that's, a, big, that's a big chasm to go from the children of Israel that got delivered from Egypt to worshipping male members. Some, some, some. What happened there? That's that's just really weird. So I had a bit of a look at this whole idea of the Baal, because in the Hebrew language, it was different to every other language. This word Baal, it actually meant the Lord of Dominion. In other words, the Lord who owned this area and this people. That's what it meant. And so here, it's almost like the devil's done the switcheroo. He's taken the Lord God 
and put in the Lord of the region. And whatever the Lord of the region says goes. It's like the government, isn't it? Listen, the Bible says that we should submit to government. Amen. I've had my vaccinations. I'm triply vaxxed. I'm vaxxed. I'm vaxxed. I'm vaxxed. I'm vaxxed. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've been vaxxed. But at what point does the law of the land come against the law of God? And God's been telling me, it's not that we're going to rise up in some sort of rebellion against the government. That's what I'm talking about. But to be able to say to people, that's wrong. Yes. What the government is, its agenda is wrong. Mm. What's happening is not right. This word, it meant the owner of an area. The Lord who has dominion in this area. This particular Lord having dominion in this particular area. This is the spiritual sense that people have. I want to ask you a question. Who or what is the Lord of your life? Because the point, the point, the clear, the clear picture here is the only way that the, that the devil was able to get them from being the children of Israel who was delivered from bondage and sin to worshipping sexual immorality and promiscuity and everything evil is that they desired some spiritual dominion to have lordship over them. Every single person that lives on the planet has a will that they want to surrender to somebody or something. That's a reality. They don't know that. And as they grow up, they become rebellious. Like, it's me, it's my will. I do what I want with my life. I'm me. I'm, I'm not a sheep. I, I, I'm an individual. And then they, you know, they dress like some other idiot and start following some other idiot just like a sheep, right? <laughs> what is your will? And who is the Lord of it? What are your desires? And who is the Lord of your desires? Or what is the Lord of your desires? It's interesting, as I started to study this, I realized that people's hearts have intention. Hmm? So things that we do and say, we want to get an outcome. Sometimes we're not even aware that we manipulate circumstances for our own intentions. That shut me down. But as you start to say things and do things as a, oh, that's it. You know, I didn't get my way. I'm going to kill myself. Or this thing happens. Oh, so I'm going to take it to death con five, you know, and just destroy everything like Russia is, like, like Putin is, right? So I'm not getting my way. I'm going to start blowing things up. Just a five-year-old kid that hasn't been able to control his temper. Just go, he's older now. That's the point. Listen, we're still the same. It's just we get older with more responsibility and more ability to just do greater destruction. That's what happens. What is your intentions? Verse 24, Then you shall call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answers with fire, He is God. See, we need spiritual dominion and authority in our families, in our church, in our city, and in our nation. We must have 100% confidence in Jesus, and his spiritual ability to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and help us to have dominion over sickness, death, and hell. Amen. Amen. Yes. See, the Holy Spirit is the one who's supposed to be the Lord of our will, the Lord of our intention, the Lord of our desires. Are you growing in your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Because this brings a whole nother dimension. You can say, I pray to God. Yes, that's a good thing. You should pray to God. But the Bible says, in the name of Jesus, faith is released. In the name of Jesus, things are moved in the supernatural realm. And the Holy Spirit's the one who teaches us how to have dominion in our lives. How to relationally work things out and not be a manipulator and not be someone who's self-destructive and not be someone who uh, is like the world. Luke 3.16, John answered saying to him, I indeed baptize you with water, but one greater than I is coming whose sandal straps I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen. Ephesians 5, 1 through 6, walking in love. And I want you to think about this. Does the Holy Spirit have an ability to change the way you see yourself and others when it comes to God's love? Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children 
and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet smelling aroma. See, because the sacrifice represented the blood. That's Jesus' sacrifice. That the power of his blood helps us. Then in verse 3 it says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as is listed for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Does the blood of Jesus... Move your conscience to be free from your carnal man in your old life. Or does your old man continually come and take ground and take things back? Because this is a problem for us, isn't it? I've been living for Jesus 28, nearly 30 years, and I'm, I'm surprised how much power the flesh has to keep getting back up off the canvas, to keep coming back at me, to keep trying to get me to, to agree with insane things. The flesh is insane. Amen? Amen. So until we get to go to heaven, we need to deal with the flesh. Thank God for the potter's house. God helps us to understand that there must be some structure to control the flesh. That's why we we challenge people to come to prayer. That's why we challenge people to come to morning prayer. So we challenge them to believe the doctrines of the Bible and read the word of God yourself. That's why uh, Pastor Mitchell challenges people to give and to break the bondages of poverty and stupidity and all the dumb things that we come up, dumb ideas that we come up with. See, because we put God in charge, he's always got a better idea, hasn't he? See, but that takes a willingness to die to the flesh. Two, and I'm moving on pretty quickly. The bloodshed, verse 33. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces and let... Uh, laid it on the wood and said, fill the water. So the whole idea of the water is that the water is the washing of the word. The Bible says that we'd wash our soul and mind with the word of God. I want to ask you, do you read the word of God knowing that it can clean your mind? Or asking God, clean my mind. I need a clean mind. And people say, we go to church, Pastor, we've got clean minds, you liar. <laughs> Amen. It's the truth, right? For some days, you could just be walking through life and you're just tired and whatever and you're just sort of like, you know, and then all of a sudden a thought comes and then it just starts to... They go, oh, no, I shouldn't be thinking that. Because <laughs> we're human beings. The devil's real. The Bible says that in the imagination of our mind, this is where the devil fights us. Hebrews 9, in the Amplified, verse 10, it says, It is a fact under the law of Moses, everything is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Neither can there be a release from sin and guilt or a cancellation of judgment. This is New Testament. I want to ask you, do you apply the blood? Because I thought about this. I thought, you know, I used to think about the blood. I plead the blood. I get up and I plead the blood on my mind. Plead the blood on my house. Plead the blood on my plead the blood, 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 blood. But I was challenging myself. How much do I plead the blood now? Do I still believe that there's power in the blood? Do I still believe a simple faith that I can lay hands on my children in the name of Jesus, plead the blood of Jesus and they can be healed? Why not? Amen. Do I believe that I can plead the blood on the streets and preach the word of God and have dominion in my city? Do I believe that I can plead the blood of Jesus at work and have dominion over demon-possessed workers? Why not? Do I believe that God can make a difference when I'm losing the battle and losing the fight as I plead the blood of Jesus and take dominion by the Holy Ghost in the fire of the Holy Ghost? Why not? It's simple, isn't it? But do I do it? Psalm 91 verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. 
nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. I don't know about you, but that's a good scripture to claim. Yes. That's a good scripture to say, you know what, God? I'm believing you to help me in this. An all-consuming fire. Verse 38 and 39 says, And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked it up, the water in the trench. And now all the people saw it. They fell on their faces. And they should have said, The Lord Jesus, he is God. The Lord Jesus, he is God. Listen to me. The Trinity and the power of the Trinity is under assault more than ever before. And I was listening to a young guy witness not that long ago. And I'm listening to the witness and I'm thinking that the young guy is not realizing that the other person is denying the Trinity. They're, they're believing it. They're saying, I believe God. But they don't believe in the Trinity. Because they believe some false doctrine. And so the guy walked away and the new convert was there and he goes, oh, that was a good witness. And I said, well, what do you think he believes? He goes, he believes in God. I said, yeah, which God do you think he believes in? He goes, same one as us. I said, no. I said, because every time you said Jesus, he would say, is only the son. He, he's only the son. Because the devil doesn't like to acknowledge that Jesus is God and came and defeated his power. The Trinity is under assault and we need to be able to articulate what it is to worship the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. I know this is simple doctor, but listen, the devil knows how to take power away from us. Yes. And the power is in the connection of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. Because if you're not connected to all three, how are you, know, how are you able to... You know, traffic through your life and hear the voice of God. Hear, and thus says the Lord, and, you know, and be able to steer your prayers and steer your life. We need, we need God to be who he is, yes. all powerful, all knowing. You ever heard that saying? He's on fire. She's on fire. Heard that saying? What does it mean? I asked someone recently what this meant. They looked at me like, like a bit of a... I said, I remember people used to say, you were on fire. And they looked at me and said, yes. And they used to say, you were on fire as well. <laughs> and I said, yes, they did. I said, how about we go to the altar today and ask God to help us? Because we need to be on fire again. Yes. We need to stir up what God has done in our lives and the promises that he's given us. See, the spiritual perspective of fire... I want you to think about this because fire has three elements, heat, fuel, and oxygen. Without one of those, fire doesn't exist. We need to be able to be combustible, that the Holy Ghost would use us in a fiery way, a new fiery way, a fresh wind of God's power and fire in our nation. Not a new doctrine, no, but the power of the Holy Ghost to bring to life all the promises and all the prophecies and all the prayers. I've been praying this prayer. Tell me if you think I'm crazy. But I've been saying, God, there's a lot of people who've died in our nation that didn't see the promises that you've given us for many, many years. What happened to their prayers? The Bible says in the book of Revelations that the prayers of those faithful saints are on the altar of incense and righteousness. I'm saying, God, I'm claiming their prayers. I'm claiming their promises. I'm claiming them. I want them now in our churches and in our life. Why not? They laid their lives down for it. They believed dying, believing that it was going to happen. Why can't we reach into the storehouse of heaven, our Father in heaven, and, and bring down the dominion that, that these people have fought for? Listen to me. Evil doesn't happen until people's wills line up and the, the will of evil and the will of a man, bang, and evil, that's how evil is perpetrated. But the same is true as God's kingdom. Is that his will and destiny happens when the will of a man or woman surrender and invite his dominion and his kingdom and his power. It's all about the will of man. That's what the devil's fighting for. 
If we are spiritually on fire, there should be a courage that is courageously contagious in us. Have you got it? Amen. Why not? There should be a compulsion to do right and to be righteous. There should be a zeal and a boldness that helps us to understand the word of God and articulate that and not be scared about the outcome. There should be a creativity to win souls and to be able to touch people with the life that Jesus died for, the abundant life. There should be a motivation to keep on fighting to our last breath and not give in and not give up. Fire is a living symbol of the divine power of the Holy Ghost that it should be in every born again believer. Verse 36 and 7, I'm finishing here. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant and you have done all these things at your word. I've done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned the people's hearts back to him again. See, it takes great courage to say that you've lost that because you can't find it unless you realise you've lost it, right? Book of Acts 2.33, it says, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out that which is now you see and hear. This is Peter, and he's saying, Listen, Jesus is at the right hand of God, ready and willing and able to pour out his power. Are we asking for it? Are we believing God for it? I changed the scripture, and you can shout me as a heretic later. I changed the the last bit of the verse and I said, The men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord God of Pastor Mitchell, Pastor Walsh, Pastor Staples, let it be known this day that you are God in my house, that you are God in my heart, you are God in my church, that that I am your servant and I've dedicated my life and family to your kingdom and your word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this city may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts back to you again as I testify of your greatness. Why not? That's all I have this morning. Let's bow our heads. I want to bring a challenge. I don't know if everybody's saved this morning, but I really felt God pushing me to preach along these lines. I've preached this sermon around a little bit. And uh, the Holy Spirit keeps saying to me that time is short. We need to be right with God because Jesus Christ is coming back. Time is coming to an end. I want to ask us this morning, are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because when Jesus comes back, time will end. When you die and pass through to eternity, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Has he washed your sins away? Is he able to forgive you because you've repented with a humble heart and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I want you to save my soul and be the Lord of my life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're not saved this morning and you need to give your life to Jesus. You'd raise your hand and say, yes, pastor, that's me. I want to make sure that my heart is right with Jesus. I'm backslidden. I haven't received Jesus. My heart is far from him this morning and I need salvation. I need the miracle of salvation. I want to know that heaven would be my home and hell would not be a judgment upon my life. Here's my hand, amen. I need God's love, his kindness. Anyone at all, amen. Okay, I believe that we're all saved this morning. But listen to me, I prayed last night and on the way up here that as we would answer the all to this morning that God would fill us with his fire that God would touch us in any dead area in our life that he would encourage us that he would uplift us that he would make the difference because he is the difference maker so what I want to do is I want to open the altars and I want you to come if you don't usually come to the altar I want you to come to the altar I want you to spend some time praying and asking God to help you in whatever area you're challenged I'm going to lay hands on everybody I'm going to believe that God's going to help us and fill us with his blood and his fire afresh. Amen. These orders are open. Come down the front. 
If you don't usually come to the front, please come to the front. Come sit on the front row. Come and spend some time in the presence of God. It's humility that releases God's dominion and God's destiny. Shanda barrebe kiala basando borobo bobo soro bobo borrebe be 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 be. Lord, we worship you, God. We agree together in the Holy Ghost, Lord, your power, your dominion, Lord God, your blood, your kingdom. Shanda bosara banda. Lord, we pray for you, your power, your Holy Ghost, and anointing. Shanda bala bala bala. Jesus, touch us, Lord God. Fill us afresh with your power and your anointing, God. We break the power of every lie and every bondage that comes against us, Lord God. The power of the Holy Ghost. Shando bo rebe siki alaba sando ro bo 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 shando. together when you say this Jesus I thank you that you died on the cross for me pour out your spirit upon my life I ask you to fill me with your power with your fire the fire of the Holy Ghost I plead the blood of Jesus on my mind on my spirit on my flesh on my soul I plead the blood of Jesus on my city and on my church and on my family my unsaved family save them Lord touch our nation help us give us your kingdom and your dominion I pray for wisdom to articulate the power of salvation the power of miracles and your kingdom we agree together and we ask you to pour out the power of the faithful saints and their prayers and their lives that have gone before us we reach into the storehouse of heaven and we ask you Lord as your children you are seated at the right hand of the Father and we believe that in the name of Jesus that you would release your kingdom and your dominion right now in Jesus name Amen let's worship God Sando borro bo si kiere be 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 raba ba 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 sana manda re be 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 ki ando borro bo sara ba ba raba ba ba ba. Just done. Just done. I just really feel like God. You can just really feel God saying to me that you know sometimes. You know, it's almost like you're knowing here what you need to do, right? But the problem is, is that the world and the flesh, right? I was, I was in the city in, in Frankston, Melbourne, and I was sitting at this cafe and I said, God, show me why these people are so freaky in the city. And as I, as I was there, it was like I just started to see these like mounds Along, the, along this alleyway, and there's people coming in and out of Westfields. And as they go by, these mouths were saying things. And the, and, the, and the Holy Ghost said to me that soothsaying is a demonic strategy that comes against the hearts of people to influence their will. Yeah. And so in this last days, the devil is trying to use anything to get and bring condemnation back to life. 
Because the Bible says, for there's no condemnation in those who live for Christ Jesus and are called according to his name. But the devil's constantly trying to get you with condemnation. Yeah? So you need to you need to understand that. Yeah? And this side of eternity, that's the fight, right? So sometimes in the new stages of being a Christian and then in times where when I went to Eastwood and when I went to different I, I got to the point where condemnation would try and become my friend. It's almost like come to me. It's all right, boy. We love you. The rest of them don't understand, but we love you. And it was like a, a condemnation became like a friend. I'm like, hey, what in the world? This is demonic. And so I would, I came to the place and said, God, what do I do to get rid of this? And God said to me, you didn't tell it to shut up. And so I started, literally, we'll be walking down the street in Eastwood. And this voice is talking to me and telling me, you're a whitey, you're not going to build this church, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that, you're not going to do this. And so I just stood in the mall and said, shut up, in Jesus' name. People are looking at me like, this guy's crazy, right? But, but I just broke its power. I said, no, that's not right. This is not right. I want to hear the voice of God. I know God loves me. I want his loving kindness. Does that all make sense to you? As I'm praying for you, it's like I just see all that. Right? Let's pray. I want you to say this, Jesus. Jesus. I break the power, break the power of, condemnation of condemnation and every lie, and every lie that, comes that comes against my life. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus sets, me free. sets me free. And right now, and right now I, set my will I set my will to believe you. To believe you. Your, word, your word, your loving kindness, your, loving kindness, your, dominion, your dominion, that you love me. That I am your daughter, and you are my father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Shando bore the hiyalaba, shando bore robo, sala bam dam 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 dam. Kiyando robo, sala bam da bare be 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 be. Shikiyande sala bam dam dam. Is anyone anyone sick? Sick in their body? Healing, they need to be healed. Sore back, sore leg. It's you. Here we go. Let's pray for you. All right, let's get a chair. They can be more than one. They can be more than one. 100%. Let's just put a chair here. So the other day when we came to Paramount, God told me I was going to pray for you. And he said to me, um, those verses in Ezekiel, thus says the Lord, um, he said to me that he speaks to you a lot, right? And you hear his voice. And it's almost like you hear his voice and you say, yes, God, yeah, that's Let's do that. And you pray and you're like, scrap, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then you get pushed back. And sometimes the devil comes in like such a flood, you're spun out. And it's almost like what God said to me is, is that every time you want to take authority and dominion, you're going to get pushed back, right? So be ready. Be more ready for that unseen thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. More ready in your mind in the unseen. And and what, when people say things, right, that, that unlocks stuff, yeah? And so sometimes the back, other, other things... It's like the devil doesn't come at When you know his strategies, he doesn't come at you front on because you can just smash him in Jesus' name. We've got the power in the blood. We've got the power and the dominion of the Holy Ghost. We can, the Bible says we cast out demons with the little finger, like the finger of God. You know, it's like it's not even an issue, right? But, but what he does is he strategizes and he, he's, he's aiming at dead areas and he's aiming, he's aiming at areas where I struggle in my mind or I struggle to feel that I'm accepted or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? It's, like, it's almost like it's almost like a subconscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So God said to me, he's teaching you to have dominion in that area because if you're going to do the things that he's telling you he wants you to do, can't afford you to get the crap beat out of your heart out there. All right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right, let's pray. <coughs> That's the sore one. Okay, right on, right on. Let's pray. Say this. Say, Jesus, Jesus. 
The blood of Jesus sets me free. I take authority over every twisted word, every twisted word, every lying spirit, every soothsaying word. Get off my life, you twisted spirit. Leave my life in Jesus' name. Shanda barrebe kiala basando borobo sarabanda barrebe bebe. God, we take authority right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Shiara basanda barrebe bebe bebe bebe. Let me say this. Say Jesus. I break every generational curse. Break every generational curse of illegitimacy. Of illegitimacy and blood curse that comes against my life. I close the door. I close the door. And I believe. And I believe your word. Your word and your kingdom. Your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand up for me. Just, just, just had to say, Jesus, Jesus, I'm free. I'm free. In your name, in your name. I take authority, I take authority over this twisted spirit. This twisted Get spirit. off my life. Get off my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Every, accusation every accusation and every lie. And every I break your power, break your power. Condemnation. condemnation. Leave my life, break my life. In, Jesus in Jesus' name. name. Just, just move that for me. Does it feel better? Try. Yeah. So I want you to think about what I said, right? And I really felt like God saying to me, He's teaching you to fight some spiritual battles, right? Yeah. Okay. And so that doesn't have to stay. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's a, it's a, the, the devil's fighting for ground. Yeah. Happened to me for two years with Sorbac. Yeah. Really bad. And every time I got angry with somebody, or every time someone spoke a harsh word, or <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't get it out of the car. Yeah. It was really bad. Yeah. But as God helped me and, and I understood. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Praise God. Let me pray for you. God, we take dominion right now. We believe you, God. Shandobo, we claim destiny by the blood of Jesus Christ. We agree together, Lord God, and we release destiny. We come against this demonic strategy right now. We bind it up and we cast it off. For it has no power and it has no strategy in the flesh. We stand against witchcraft and divination, every curse of the necromancer. I curse this death in Jesus' name. Shando Robo Salaba Baba Baba Baba. Someone's praying against you. That's what it is. That's what it is. So I want you to pray against whoever's praying. Say, God, show me who's praying against me and pray it back on them. Yeah? All right. And blow for a good report. All right. Let's pray. In the chair. All right. Let's, let's pray. That's pretty good. Okay, all right, let's just stand up for me. So I'll just say, say, Jesus, I believe that I'm your child and that you love me. I break the power of every lie, of every cursed word and every evil that's spoken against me. I break its power in Jesus' name and I release life. I command my muscles to be whole. I claim dominion and healing. Move around for me. Just move, move it. Just move it around. Move, stretch it a bit. Does it feel better? Yep. Yep. So, um, so when's it, when's it come back? When do you know what 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 the door is or what the what the what the thing is? What is it? What is it that releases it? Do you think? I don't. Yeah, can be. As we get older, things happen, right? For stuff for specifically breakthroughs, spiritual breakthroughs. That's what the ears are about. That's why the ear comes against you. Because 
Yeah. Yeah, so let's just pray. Jesus, I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and the preparation of the gospel. I thank you for the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. Teach me, Lord, to have dominion in my own mind with my words and with my intentions. I break the power of the stain of iniquity and the blood of Jesus sets me free. I break every curse of words and blood curse in Jesus' name. Shando borrebe ki alaba shando borrebe be 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 Leave in Jesus' name. Shando bo ki alaba shanda ba 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 Rebe ki anda ba sa Come open in Jesus' name. Shendi alaba shando borrebe be 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 Amen. Better? Better? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, thank you very much for having me preach. Thank you, Pastor, if you're on there, if we can see you in the, in the weeks to come, praying for Pastor Stapes uh, to have a just a victorious time there. You're telling me he's just going over to preach revival as uh, Stu was praying. Let's believe that God works miracles yeah. through, through the pastor and he comes back with just, a, just an awesome, awesome report. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I was praying was that while he's away, this church would grow. This church would grow spiritually and in numbers as well. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a clap for us. Praise God, Father, we thank you for that word. Hallelujah. Thanks for coming out, church, and supporting church while pastors away. Uh, just remember the band tonight, the concert tonight. If you could bring somebody, that would be fantastic. Um, and just remember also to pray for Pastor Staples and Adelina this week that uh, everything would go well with their health while they're in India and that uh, God would move in the revival meetings. And it would just be a turning point in the Chennai church. They've copped a bit of a towel and lately with their pastor being crook and stuff and just that God would help them uh, build that church. And if uh, God spoke to you this morning, please uh, thank Pastor Corey for coming to preach and you know, and feel free to talk to him about what God spoke to me about. And uh, with all that, uh, Josh, why don't you close us off in a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you for the ministry this morning, for the words, for the healing, God, for this sermon. I pray, God, that you would help us as we go to seal in our hearts the importance of the blood and the importance of the fire of the Holy Spirit, God. I pray that you be with us as we go and bring us back safely tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.